about that. Hi, I'm Inez McDermott, and um, I am um, a uh, emeritus professor of art history at New England College, meaning I just finished, retired from teaching after 25 years. Um, I'm also an independent curator and um, have just finished curating an exhibition at the Museum of the White Mountains at Plymouth State University um, called um, An Enduring Presence, The Old Man of the Mountain. So um, because of that, um, I am also giving lectures that accompany the exhibition. So I hope you all have a chance to see the exhibition. It's on view in Plymouth until um, September 16th. Um, and what this talk tonight, The Old Man, His Life and Legacy is all about, is really giving you an overview of the themes of the exhibit that we developed. Um, so my first slide is an image of the old man taken about a week before he fell. Uh, were you all in New Hampshire when he fell? Do you remember where you were and what you thought? That's one of the interesting things that we discovered in researching this exhibit is that so many people wanted to tell us where they said, I remember that the way that I remember when Kennedy was assassinated, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, when the Twin Towers fell, it seemed to have a huge impact, especially people from New Hampshire. I think when I speak with people who aren't from New Hampshire, they don't understand it at all. Um, and they, they sort of have this vague idea that there was this rock formation, but why do people make such a big deal out of it? And one of the aims of this exhibition was to kind of figure that out. And I don't think we answered that question, but I think we pulled together a lot of material that um, sort of showed how intrinsic and how ubiquitous the old man is in New Hampshire culture. So I'm assuming most of you know, but just in case you don't, if you take a look at this map, um, oh, this isn't gonna work on the Apple TV, but if you take a look at, it's still not gonna work. Um, yeah, there we go. So we're looking at this area. And then of course we see right here, Franconia Notch State Park, Old Man of the Mountain. And the Old Man of the Mountain sits on the cliff of Cannon Mountain to the west of Mount Washington. Um, and today it is part of Franconia Notch State Park. And I'll tell you the story about how that came to be as well. So the day after May 3rd, sometime on the night of May 2nd or May 3rd, 2003, most likely May 3rd, um, some campers in the area said they heard something after midnight on May 3rd. Um, it was discovered that the um, old man had fallen from his perch. Um, it was discovered by uh, state park workers early in the morning and immediately people recalled, actually, I think this date is wrong. This is probably a May 3rd date. Um, many people who were involved with the promotion of the old man who were involved with um, working at the state park were called. There was an immediate press conference. Governor Craig Benson was governor at the time and he vowed to put together a committee to figure out what they were going to do. The man who's standing there with his hand over his face is Dick Hamilton. And Dick Hamilton was the president of White Mountain Attractions. Um, he was one of, he knew everybody um, and was one of the, he was, a, I think of him as a connector. He was always connecting um, people who love the White Mountains, who are working in the White Mountains, who are doing work to promote tourism, um, conservation to um, to all work together in various uh, for various and sundry um, projects. Um, he was one of the first people there. He lived in Littleton, worked in Lincoln, and he used to tell this story about passing through every night and turning around and saying good night, boss, to the old man. And he told this story, which is is very um, kind of sad. Um, on the night of May 2nd, he was on his way home. It was a Friday night and he looked back and it was cloudy. And he said, good night, boss, wherever you are. So he didn't even see the old man that last, that last night. Um, and what I'm showing you as well is what the um, cliff looked like 
the next day after the old man had fallen. Um, today, if you go up there, what you'll see is what this committee decided to do, which was not to rebuild something, some artificial um, monument to the old man up on the cliff, but to make these what they call profilers. And so if you go up to the plaza and stand, if you find your height and stand on the step according to your height and look up through this, this profiler, um, what you end up seeing is a good approximation of the old man. How, how many of you have, has anyone done that? Whoops, what do you think about, do you think they did a... Oh, well, I, I love the original. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was, it looked like it. Yeah. But it, it was something that was safe. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty good. It is. It's, I think it was a good solution. Um, I know many people feel like they should rebuild it some, some way, but... Um, yeah, the, <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to happen, partly because of the geology there. It's just impossible. It would just fall right back down. It's, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but the old man still lives. <laughs> we still, these are all um, images that have been created since the old man has fallen. There, if you go up to Littleton, you find this um, T-shirt and hat in um, the Lahoots, uh sporting goods store. Um, postcards are still being sold of the old man of the mountain. And of course, Stone Face Brewing Company. I don't know if you can tell, but that's actually the profile that's made out of the, um, the hop there in Stone Face. Can you see that a little bit? A little bit of a suggestion of the profile. Yeah, yeah. And there, T Tamworth Brewing Company has an old man um, vodka i think and we st we still continue to see them in advertising and, and tourism and things like that so how does the old man become popular well it goes back to 1805 when first um white settlers are settling around franconia notch and there are two competing stories about how the old man was quote unquote discovered um, and these two competing stories both involved people who were hired to survey the area. And they were, went down to what was called Farron's Pond, which is now Profile Lake, and looked up and saw the old man. They had camped out so they could continue with their surveying. One was apparently to survey roads. The other story was someone was there to survey land for tax purposes. And one of, one of the tales says that the, um, the men looked up and said, that is Jefferson. And Jefferson was the president at the time. And so that was sort of, that was the story that kind of stuck, that there was an image of Jefferson that was up there. Throughout the years, sometimes he was compared to um, President Washington, um, later President Lincoln, but for the most part, this idea that an image of Jefferson was up there on the cliffs was kind of talked about, but not really written about. Now, there had been um, stories of indigenous tales about a great spirit who had been up there and kind of immortalized on the side as well. That, there still needs to be a lot of research done about that because a lot of those stories are really, have come from white authors who said that they had heard this tale. So that's a, that's a bit of exploration that we, we really need to, to delve into. But for the most part, the old man starts to become more widely known in about 1850. And that's because Nathaniel Hawthorne writes a story called The Great Stone Face that's widely published. And that story, it tells a story of this young man named Ernest who lives in the shadow of the old man and is forever looking for, um, the, a man who could uh, equal the values that he saw in the old man. The old man was uh, overlooked the village with sort of a benign countenance. He was stoic and strong, but he also protected them. And Ernest always felt that he, that there was a man out there who would be, who would come one day and his profile would match the profile that was up overlooking Ernest's life. Of course, you know what happens at the end. Ernest grows up to be an old man and everyone says, but Ernest, it's you. Um, 
widely popular story. The other saying that gets very popular about the old man is the one attributed to Daniel Webster about, um, you know, up in the mountains of New Hampshire, God Almighty has hung out a sign to show that here, there he makes men. Daniel Webster probably never said that. We have no, we have no evidence that he ever, no written evidence that he ever said it and no uh, written anecdotes that he ever said it. However, it's attributed to Daniel Webster and it starts to become popular around the same time that Nathaniel Hawthorne's story is, um, uh, becomes popular as well. Now, Hawthorne and Webster had been in the White Mountains long before this. They had been traveling through in the 1830s, as had um, Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson and many, many writers and, and thinkers and, and men of letters. The other people who traveled through were um, early explorers, um, early geologists, botanists, meteorologists. They were all coming up there. And what brought them up there for the most part was an incident that happened in 1826, where there was an enormous landslide in Crawford Notch. And that landslide um, completely obliterated a family. But the odd thing was, the house remained intact and untouched. They were called the Willie family, and you can still go and visit the site in, um, in Crawford Notch. Well, that was like international news. It was sort of this curiosity, this tragedy. It excited people's imaginations. Um, this idea that how could God be so cruel? You know, this family, this God-fearing family, this wonderful family, and they did everything right, and they would take in hike, you know, travelers on their way through. And um, how could you know how could this have happened? But it brought people to the region to look and to to gawk at it. Essentially, um, that was one of the reasons Hawthorne had come. It was one of the reasons that early artists had started to come, like Thomas Cole. Um, they wanted to see those those areas of of horror. Because the United States at the time, or America at the time, didn't have, we didn't have that kind of history, the way that Europe had this long and deep history. So any of these kinds of stories were really a way to kind of start collecting um, an American legacy and lore. So just to sort of give you a background as to why people start coming up there, it wasn't really just for the beauty. It was to kind of get excited about this event that had happened. Um, but people had also come up to do some, um, some, well, many, many different kinds of things. We, I don't need to read this whole thing, but again, this is from Nathaniel Hawthorne, where he's writing about the people that he saw at Ethan Crawford's home, where most people would go up and stay. Of course, the Willie House had been destroyed, so everyone has to stay at Ethan Crawford's. And he talks about them, you know, different kinds of people. Um, the, you know, a mineralogist, uh, and he, he had referred to the owner of a gold opera glass. So somebody who's very fancy. Um, two men from Georgia who were there to climb Mount Washington, a doctor and his wife, a trader, um, two married couples who were there sort of on a, a wedding trip. Um, and then, of course, woodcutters. So it's bringing all these types of people together, which is something that Hawthorne was really celebrating. Hawthorne, by the way, had also written a story about the Willie family, and he called that the ambish, ambitious guest. And that had been published in 1838. So that also brought people up to the, um, to the White Mountains as well. Um, so along with all of these people who are coming up, artists are coming as well and scientists, both amateur and professional scientists. So the image on the right, it's not a great painting, but I like to show it because it, it does two things. One, it's by Albert Bierstadt, who you might know Albert Bierstadt's paintings because he did those enormous canvases out west. He would go out with the um, surveying teams to um, out to um, Yosemite and you know further uh, you know uh, further west of Yellowstone um, and he would both take photographs and make these enormous paintings but he also he was from New Bedford he would also come back 
and take photographs with his brothers who were who made stereographs, which I'll also talk about in a minute, um, and also make paintings of the region as well. He saw this as a place to also explore the way he had out west. Um, and what he's also showing us of these figures in the foreground here are people enjoying themselves on Profile Lake. Because when Bierstadt is there in the, this is probably done around 1860, um, there's a hotel right nearby. Because when all these people start coming up, you need, Ethan Crawford's place isn't large enough to hold them all. So this is the start of the grand hotels in the um, White Mountain area. And, you know, among the few that survive are the um, Mount Washington Hotel and then the Mountain View Grand and, and one or two others. But the Profile House, which was right next to Profile Lake, attracted a lot of people. And what they do is they come to see the old man, but they'd also come to enjoy themselves with boating and hiking and horseback riding and um, uh, uh, bowling and golf and all sorts of things. And they'd have music in the evening and theatrical performances, and they'd have amazing four course dinners and a full wine list. And, you know, it was a really pretty um, fancy place. And many people would come for the whole summer. The other thing that attracts people to the area is the science up there. It's the geology and the botany and the, um, and the weather. So William Oakes, who was a lawyer from Boston turned kind of amateur botanist um, and amateur scientist, kind of gives up the practice of law. And what he decides to do is to create an entire um, uh, sort of survey of the White Mountains. And he hires Isaac Sprague, who's the illustrator for Audubon, to come and illustrate images in the White Mountains for him. And so what we see on the left is a plate from Oakes's book that eventually gets published. He only had 16 plates in it, and he, but he had descriptions of each place as well. Oakes's um, big dreams kind of fell short, and he died right around the time that this was published, unfortunately. Um, so what we're looking at here is the scene that Oakes has created of um, the old man of the mountain. And this book had two plates that made reference to the old man of the mountain. So in a book of 16 plates, Oakes felt it was a, the old man was important enough to do, to make two plates. When I say plates, that means a print. Um, and these are still, if you're ever in an antique shop, these are still sold. Um, oftentimes they're hand colored. They were widely re reproduced and, and very, very popular. The first image though <laughs> of the old man was done again by an amateur scientist. This was published in 1828, and it was a drawing that was submitted to Benjamin Silliman's um, Journal of Science. I'm sorry, now I can't remember the exact title. He was a Yale um, scientist. He was very interested, as many scientists were at the time, of finding evidence of the Great Flood. Um, but someone had, uh, a General Martin Field from Vermont had been traveling through the White Mountains gave um, Silliman a verbal description of what he had seen and sent along this drawing that he said was by a gentleman from Boston. I kind of suspect that that drawing was done from someone's oral description as opposed to someone who actually saw it. But, but at any rate, this is the first time we actually see an attempt, a published an attempt to, uh, to represent the old man of the mountain. At the time, they called it Profile Mountain, and it's, it's gone back and forth, being called Cannon Mountain and Profile Mountain throughout the, the centuries. Um, another scientific um, exploration, Charles Jackson is the first geologist to do a report to the state of New Hampshire. He publishes it in 1844, and he brings along with him an artist to make illustrations, kind of in the same way that Beer starts going out west with surveyors as an artist to make illustrations as well. And this is by Hosiah Dwight Whitney, um, and it becomes a very popular print of the old man as well. But this is in a scientific journal talking about the geology of the old man, but um, Jackson thought it important enough to include 
a scene that one might find when they came upon the old man. And again, this was reproduced in all kinds of travel rec travel journals um, by the late um, 1820s. Um, the, there was sort of, uh, you could call it a mini grand tour uh, that were public, that many of them were published that sent people to upstate New York, to Saratoga, Niagara Falls, across Quebec, and then down into the White Mountains. And the old man was often referenced. And if there was an illustration of the old man, we would often see this reproduced with no credit to Whitney. Yes. They were, they, he was called the old man of the mountain. I know in the 1830s, there was a young girl who made drawings of him and she called it the old man of the mountain. So I think that he was it's called that very early. It's just stuck from there. I mean, they, so they called it the profile. They called it the old man of the mountain or the old man of the mountains um, went back and forth. Um, the great stone face. It never really had an official name, mm. but as far as I can tell, the 1830s, they were calling it the old man of the mountain. Usually in those guidebooks, they would say, they would call it a peculiar profile. <laughs> but I think this one is, yeah, this is the old man of the mountain too. Right? So that was about 1840. This is just another example of one of those prints that might be found in one of those, those guidebooks. The first photograph taken of the old man was a daguerreotype. And daguerreotype is the first uh, photography that is um, presented to the public. There was another process that was uh, more akin to the positive negative um, process that most of us grew up with maybe not you nick you're probably just used to digital but um and a, a daguerreotype is an image that is exposed on a copper plate that's treated with various chemicals um, and the resulting image is actually backwards the same way that we would find on a, a negative um, so if a photographer wanted to make an image that was positive, they would have to photograph that daguerreotype again. So whenever you see a daguerreotype, just know that that's usually the reverse. It's the reverse image. Um, they're very difficult to see. They're very highly reflective. Um, and uh, this was done in 1841, September 11th, 1841. And we know that because the man who made it was a Boston dentist named Samuel Bemis, who came to New Hampshire every summer and stayed with Abel Crawford, who was related to Ethan Crawford of the famed Crawford house where everyone used to stay. And Bemis was, like many dentists of the time, he was an inventor and kind of a tinkerer. In 1839, the daguerreotype process is introduced to the world in France by um, Jacques Louis Mande Daguerre, which is why it's called Daguerreotype. He sends a, agent, a representative to the United States in 1840. And that man gives a demonstration in Boston of this process. And Bemis immediately buys the kit and heads up to, to New Hampshire and starts making photographs. And what's wonderful about it is he is so kind of scientifically oriented that he documents every image that he made. So he, we know um, what he was photographing. We know what the weather was like. We know what time of day it was. We know what the wind velocity was. We know how damp it was. Um, and oftentimes, because it's an expensive process, he wouldn't be happy with his exposure and he would wipe off the plate. So there were, I think he tried five images between September 10th and September 11th of the Old Man of the Mountain. And we think this is one he did on September 11th. None of the others have been found yet. Um, and he, um, a doctor from Littleton talked about coming upon him and helping him cut down some trees so he could see, so he could get a better view. So maybe the first photographer's assistant in, um, in history, in American history as well. Bemis may very well be the first landscape photographer in this country. We're almost positive he's the first landscape photographer in New Hampshire. Um, but 
it's not a great image, but it's really exciting to know that he was there um, making this image. And if you see up in the top right, sort of the about a quarter of the way down, you see that little sort of square, um, little light square there. We think that he wiped off a plate, uh, um, wiped off his plate and re-exposed it because he wasn't happy with what had been there before. He was also photographing the Lafayette House, which was the first hotel up there. And there hasn't been an, an image of the Lafayette House found that he made. So we think that that may be the windows of the Lafayette House that he was making. That's pure speculation, but I think that it kind of makes sense. Um, so where was I going with that? Um, completely lost. <laughs> but just very exciting to think about in 1841, before a lot of tourists are going up there, um, and Spemus is doing this for his own interests. Um, and those kits were 80 pounds that he's carrying along some pretty rocky roads. And the exposure took about an hour and a half. So he sets up his view camera and exposes it and it sits there for about an hour and a half, which is why you can see it's not all that highly detailed. So he's really at the, the early stages of photography. As the years go by, lenses are improved, chemicals are improved, and exposure times become much less, uh, uh, much less, uh, not nearly as long. Where, where does that live now? That is um, a photography collector who also sells photographs. So if you gave him the right offer, he would probably sell it to you. <laughs> He's in Boston. His name is Greg French. He also owns a, another wonderful one of Crawford Notch. Um, and the other thing about Bemis, too, is um, Samuel Oakes, who had the, oops, who had um, Sprague do these illustrations, we have a letter from um, Oakes to Bemis saying, I'm working on a project. I've bought myself a camera. I'm hoping you can come and help me learn how to use it. And we don't know if Bemis ever answered him, but it's kind of tempting to think that Oakes was also thinking about using photography somehow as source material. You, you couldn't print photographs at this time, but using, uh, using photography to perhaps help Sprague with his illustrations. You know if that's a four by five? It's um it's a full plate, which is uh, it's around four by five. Yeah. So most daguerreotypes, when you see them in little um, shops with uh, portraits, are sm much smaller. They're quarter plates usually. So this is four times that size. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Nick. That's a good question. So photography becomes a way for people to, to understand and to know the old man of the mountain as well. And by the middle of the nineteenth century. Um, photography is advanced enough with the positive and negative processes, um, either using glass plate negatives or um, a version that become not film, but something that becomes a little bit more um, flexible and malleable like film um, with smaller cameras and uh, the use of a process um, and uh, a type of photography called the stereograph. And what that is, is a camera that has two separate lenses in it, eye width apart. So you're looking through it, you're making the image, you're developing it. And when you look through this um, little viewer called a stereoscope, what you see is something three-dimensional. So you would look at the old man and feel like you were right there. You'd feel like you could, you know, you could, there was some texture there, you could reach out and touch him. The stereographs or stereo cards were so popular by the middle of the 19th century that people talked about um, having libraries full of them, that you could sit in your armchair and visit, visit the world. But they were also kind of like early postcards because you would be up there visiting and you would buy a set of them and bring them home so you could remember the places that you'd been. So, you know, it was a way for people to see the old man um, if they'd never been there, or to remember the old man if they had been. And the profile house was really the center of where people came 
to um, to spend time on that side of uh, on the west side of Mount Washington, and also spend time not just seeing the old man, but they go and see the sites in Franconia Notch, the basin and the flume. Um, and by the time uh, train travel, by the 1850s, there were trains that um, would um, go from um, Plymouth to Gorham and across to Littleton and then to Bethlehem, that people could leave the profile house in the morning. They could climb Mount Washington on a guided trip and come back and be back at the profile house for dinner. So many people would spend, spend the whole summer there. Trains did not go to Franconia Notch, though, until um, 1878. For the most part, you had to get um, the train um, to Plymouth, and then you take a stagecoach. Or you might take the train to Bethlehem and then take the stage from Bethlehem to Franconia Notch. And it wasn't until the 1870s that the owners of the Profile House built their own private rail line um, to the Profile House. And we have in the exhibit, this was so exciting that we found this, we have in the exhibit, when they would punch your ticket, they'd, the punch that would, um, that would uh, be revealed would be a little profile of the old man. So there'd be this little, little negative space that had the old man's. And that, is, um, that punch is owned by the people at Clark's Trading Post. And they used to have a little train. I think they still do. And they used to, but they used to use the punch and then they realized it was getting a little too old and fragile, but, um, but we we're so excited to find that. Yeah. Do you know if any of the tracks from that private rail are still in that area? I think there's a little part of it that's still there um, that, but I'm not positive. I think, I think there is, but I think a, a lot of it was paved over for the, you know how there was the bike trail through there? So if you're, if you're ever up in, in um, the Notch area, Profile House sits pretty much where the tram parking lot is today. And it was enormous. It, at its height, it um, could house 600 guests and then all the attendant um, staff. And then um, this is a little bit earlier, but it also they also had 20 cottages. And then of course, they had all the outbuildings for not just horses, but by the turn of the 20th century for automobiles and all kinds of things. What happened to I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> so just so you see, I put a little you can see that with that arrow sort of where the profile house sat. Okay, and just some of the memorabilia. This is one of the things we really enjoyed working on for this exhibit was the um, finding, we call it ephemera, all of these wonderful um, pamphlets and, and, and photographs and just, you know, even just for the, um, the railroad, the beautiful graphic design that was done. And many of the artists and residents who were asked to stay for the summer at these grand hotels, oftentimes they were also responsible for doing the graphic design of these as well. So that's another area that I think um, someone should do some research on because the, um, you know, the attention paid to the just the beautiful um, the aesthetics of how this uh, these works are presented is really, really fun to look at. Here's another example of a stereograph. This was Albert Bierstadt's brothers made this, um, this stereograph. And I wanted to show it just so you can see the kind of um, fun that people would have on Profile and Echo Lakes. Today, you can only swim and boat on Echo Lake and Profile Lake you can fish at, but um, I think boating is not allowed. Yeah, I, I think it's really off limits, but Echo Lake you can still spend time at. And here, again, just in the interior of the profile house, so you get a sense of the enormity. And here's just an example of the, here's the narrow gauge rail. So you get a sense. So if you're thinking about, um, to the right of that would have been Route 93. And so this area is sort of would run um, I think where that bike trail is today, but I do, I'm pretty sure I've seen tracks, but it's been, uh, I haven't 
really been exploring up there for a year or two. Um, and just to give you a sense of the kind of information people would get, um, assuming they're coming from Boston and New York, um, and you know all the different options they had in uh, travel. And always the old man sort of at the center of the advertisement. Of, I mentioned um, artists in residence and one of the most um, prolific and probably famous artist in residence at the um, profile house was an artist named Edward Hill. And Hill was a resident of first um, uh, Lancaster and then Littleton. Uh, his brother had been an artist and had moved out west and Hill um, spent 15 years at the profile house and um, made numerous paintings of the old man. This is a painting that's a little bit larger. If you think about being a guest at one of these hotels, usually you're somebody of means and certainly buying stereographs is a fun thing to do, but you might want something a little bit more to take back as a reminiscence of your trip. So you might buy from this artist who has been having dinner with everybody, who's part of the social life at the hotel and has gotten to know people, you might wanna buy a, an image, a painting of the old man of the mountain. And if you're really well to do, you might want something even larger. Um, but most of Hill's production was pretty much these maybe 16 by 20 um, portraits of the old man of the mountain. This may very well have been, um, may have hung in um, one of the um, hotel rooms or something like that. So I don't know if you can tell, but that white space sort of in the middle of the, um, of the painting is the profile house. So it's also a reminder to people of the beautiful views that they can experience if they go um, hiking and, you know, sort of taking in the vista. So while it's not a specifically an image of the old man it's it's sort of based on your visit to uh to the profile house and with of course always an aim to go and see the old man this painting was done in 1876 by david johnson and you can see this painting today at the um, state house visitor center it's enormous and it was commissioned by one of the owners of the Profile Hotel. David Johnson was not um, an artist in residence. And I find it interesting that he was commissioned to make this painting when Edward Hill was in residence at the Profile House at the same time. Um, that's another thing I'd really like to, to look into. But um, Hill, uh, David Johnson painted this for Mrs. Taft, Mrs. Richard Taft. Taft was one of the owners of the Profile House, along with Charles Greenleaf. Um, Johnson submitted this to the Philadelphia Centennial in 1876, the celebration of our you know, um, uh, becoming a country, and um, he won a prize for it. So the Centennial oftentimes would have, or the Centennial would have representations of artists from different states. So there would be a New Hampshire pavilion and there would be artworks from, um, from each state. And so this represented New Hampshire. There were some other paintings there too, but this won the prize. It was the only prize that Johnson ever won. Um, and later, um, Mrs. Taft donated it to the state of New Hampshire where it hung for a while in the library and it's now in the visitor center. So if you're ever in Concord, um, just walk in and take a look. It's really, really a lovely painting. But it does the same kind of thing that Bierstadt's earlier did. It shows you the old man, but it also shows you people really enjoying themselves, which makes sense because the owner of a hotel wants to show the kinds of things that people can do. Um, and the, you know, the sort of wonderful weather, which if you've ever spent much time in Franconia Notch is not all that often. And in fact, many writers talked about how it was so worthwhile to go and told you where to stand and to just wait because the clouds would clear. And then some of the pros around the old, seeing the old man was quite um, 
uh, romantic about how the clouds would clear and it was so that heavens were clearing and a chorus of angels were, you know, tearing through the clouds so you could reveal the glorious image. And it was really um, quite um, fun to read, to read those. Um, and, you know, Johnson's doing the same thing. It's, you know, is this a storm coming in? Is this a clearing storm? Um, but always the old man, you know, in a clear profile so that we get this sense that here he is, like Hawthorne's um, great stone face kind of overseeing everything and all is right with the world. In later years, um, Charles Greenleaf would also commission a painting of the old man that looked a lot like Johnson's, and that was from Samuel Gary, and that hung at Greenleaf's Boston Hotel as a way to advertise to people that you could stay at the Hotel Vendôme in Boston, but you might also want to visit the, the uh, Profile House up north. Um, I also, what, going, getting back to Hill, um, if you notice the stereograph, you might notice that it's very specific and very clear in terms of a photograph. And you might ask yourself, how did he get so close to the old man? There weren't telephoto lenses at the time. And if you look at this closely, which is really impossible on a screen, what you end up noticing is this is actually a stereograph of a painting. So this is a very typical painting that Edward Hill would do of the old man. This is what his paintings looked like, which also featured the clouds clearing and the, the great reveal. One of the problems with photographing the old man is that he's always so far away. If you're a photographer, you're standing back here, and even Johnson is having trouble kind of making him so prominent. If you try to get closer, apparently the closest place you could get kind of made him fade from view a little bit. And so using a painting made a lot more sense. Kilburn, Benjamin Kilburn, who made this stereograph and owned the largest stereograph com company in the world, which was in Littleton, New Hampshire at the time, was a friend of Hill's, never mentioned it, never credited Hill. But we assume that that was just their, their working relationship. Um, they were certainly great friends. I just wanted to show you a couple of later images of the profile house. You can see how many cottages there were. So you want to know what happened. <laughs> Oh, this is just um, just to show you, tourism changed a little with automobiles because people could just go up for a day. So the Profile House, while still very popular, um, I think the owners started to see the writing on the wall that, that people weren't coming for the whole summer. They might come for a week or something like that. Um, but still quite a lot of uh, visitation. In 1923, it burned down. By this time, Greenleaf had sold the um, hotel a few years before. It was owned by a father and son from Bethlehem, New Hampshire. And the whole place was totaled within a few hours. Um, the owners, the Abbots, wanted to talked about rebuilding and within a few days said they just couldn't do it. I think this automobiles and the changing nature of tourism was really um, really not making it feasible. They owned 6,000 acres. They pretty much owned all of Franconia Notch. Um, they said that they were going to have to offer um, lumber rights to the lumber companies in order to recoup their losses, but they wanted to turn it into a protected space. They wanted the, part, the state to buy it, and the state couldn't outright purchase it. Lumbering at the time, by the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, timber companies coming to the North Country were wreaking so much havoc. Um, New Hampshire, the White Mounds were being cut down, clear cut. Um, they were doing controlled burns. People in Manchester were complaining when, I think we all experienced that, or actually we're lucky we didn't experience it a few weeks ago, but my daughter and other family members in New York and Philly couldn't go outside because of the fires in, in Quebec. Um, people in Manchester would complain 
when there were fires up north because their laundry was getting all covered with soot and the, the smoke and, and the inhalation. Water, waterways were being clogged. Um, it was just a mess. But timber companies were still trying to find valuable timber. So the Abbots wanted to sell to the timber companies if they couldn't find another buyer. So the state couldn't pony up the money. And the fairly newly formed Society for the Protection of New Hampshire Forests partnered with the state. And they had been instrumental in the Weeks Act of about 12 years before. And the Weeks Act had been responsible for forming White Mountain National Forest and protecting waterways. Um, so the state agreed to pay $200,000 if the Forest Society could raise another 200,000. They also partnered with the um, New Hampshire Federation of Women's Clubs, and they don't get enough attention. But you can see that um, this is from uh, the, the image in the, the center is from their bulletin, the old man of the mountain is for sale. And that was from 1923. So it was almost immediately, they were on it and saying that one of their um, focuses for their, they were a, a nationwide federation, was conservation. They were very much involved in, in putting their money and their efforts towards conservation. So they partnered up with the Forest Society and the Appalachian Mountain Club, which was not so much an advocacy group, but they shared a lot of the same values and a lot of the same board members. Um, various people donated. Um, one of the interesting ones to me was James Storrow, for whom Storrow Drive is named, gave $10,000. Um, a number of really wealthy people uh, gave money. But the bulk of the money was raised by children and individuals. So the women's club helped spread the word among elementary schools. Um, and they started a penny campaign. And there were news, they, were, they were so good at getting um, newspapers to publish pictures of kids who were standing there with their you know, little bag of money that they collected. And um, the Forest Society did a program um, you can see at the top, it says certificate of purchase to purchase trees so that you could buy a tree. And at the heart of all of this was save the old man. Right? So the little kids, the newspaper stories were always, you know, little William Wilkie, I think his name was, doesn't want the old man to, you know, to be, um, to have the forest cut down around him. So he's giving his nickel allowance so that, you know, that won't happen. Um, all over the country. Yeah, but, but well, and, and the Appalachian Mountain Club and the Forest Society had headquarters in Boston as well. So it was kind of East Coast, but the work that the Women's Federation did was all over the country. And they kept a constant tally of the money that was coming in. And it seemed to be something that really spurred the um, imagination, I think, of school teachers and schools. And so they would have school wide drives and things like that. I mean, obviously, the big money came from New Hampshire and, and Boston area. Um, the image on the right is a composite photo. I mean, that, that was basically early Photoshop. So the old man never looked like that with, but it was a way to scare people and show them what, uh, what it might look like. Um, and there's the buy a tree to help save the notch. And there was a funny story I was reading where people thought that they actually, if they purchased a tree, that they could come up and choose the tree that they purchased and put their name on it. And so they, they realized that they, they needed to work on their messaging a little bit. Um, but at any rate, is incredibly successful. They were able to raise the money. And in 1928, um, they dedicated the park as the state of New Hampshire Franconia Notch Forest Reservation and Memorial Park. It was also a park dedicated to those who had served, which is kind of lost to us now. You never see signs that call it a memorial park anymore. But that was also part of the messaging. By a, by a tree in honor of our veterans. And um, there was a whole, um, I think Arbor Day emerged around this time too. It's the idea of trying to save the, um, 
the, your natural environment as a patriotic act. And certainly on the heels of World War I, um, this was seen as something that was automatically, you know, a good thing to do. And there was um, a lot of connections between saving uh, our forested areas and acknowledging our veterans. Um, so September 1928, big dedication. There was um, a pageant, uh, many um, uh, officials spoke, and in many of the speeches that they made, they mentioned the old man. And they talked about the old man as the spirit of independence of New Hampshire, of the old man looking out over us and keeping us safe. This very same kind of rhetoric that we heard with um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, and also making that strong connection between New Hampshire identity and the identity of the old man of the mountain is, is somebody stoic and strong. By the 1940s, 1945, the old man of the mountain becomes the New Hampshire state emblem. But even before that, we see him on license plates. Um, you know, we see him on, on, on signs. Stamps were issued over the years, our state quarter. Um, remember when we used tokens, the old man of the mountain was on the tokens. I think we still see him so much that we don't even see him anymore. You know, that we just, he just is still part of New Hampshire visual culture in so many ways. So the other part of the story is saving the old man. Because we save him for we saved him from um, being, you know, sort of destroy his environment being destroyed by lumber companies and by creating a state park around him. But as early as the 1870s, it was recognized that this profile, which was made up of um, five and more granite slabs, um, was destined to fall. The granite that it's made of is called Conway granite, and it's very um, it's very porous and not. You think of granite as something that is rock solid, but this is not. It's very susceptible to freezing and thawing, and um, parts of it is just kind of crumbling away. Um, in addition to that, these were just slabs or ledges that were kind of clinging to the side of that that cliff. So Appalachian Mountain Club. Um, members had gone to Charles Greenleaf, the owner of the profile house and said, this isn't gonna last much longer. Is there anything you can do? Um, the second geological study that was done in 1878, um, in that study, um, Charles Hitchcock says, if you wanna see this, you better get up there now because it's not gonna last much longer. So this idea that the old man was suddenly um, in peril in the later 20th century is not true. It was always, always in peril. Charles Greenlee finally found somebody in 1916, a quarryman from Quincy, Massachusetts named Edward Geddes, who said that he had a way, he figured out a way to keep the old man intact. What he said was the forehead ledge, the top ledge was sliding forward. And he invented some turnbuckles with hinges where he, he basically attached them to the back part of the, uh, of the ledge. Um, and this is him on the left. He was in his 50s when he did this. It took him eight days in October 1916, sitting on that forehead ledge. So you can see there's a huge gap there. Um, and then another image of him as he's hammering in one of the whatever it is that's, that's holding it up there. And then a, an image of the... Um, the way those those hinges work and he wanted them to be hinges because of the freezing and thawing there needed to be some kind of give there. He went up a few times over the years, I think the last time he went was 1838 um, and determined that there had been very little movement. Um, at around that time other crews went up there and they put in sort of a version of epoxy they added more hinges and turnbuckles. And by the 1850s, around the time that um, President Eisenhower comes up and declares it the old man's birthday in June 24th, 1855, um, 1955, thank you, <laughs> um, 100, his 150th birthday, 
um, the state starts to um, put aside money to have the old man inspected and, and, um, and preserved every year. So this was the year 1955. Eisenhower comes up. This is also a big PR thing. It's a way the whole state celebrates it. There are all kinds of events in every town. Um, it's a way to kind of give a, a little boost to tourism in New Hampshire at the time. And it, it certainly works. Um, and Eisenhower in his speech said, you know, um, people keep asking me what the old man, what I think of the old man, but I want to know what the old man thinks of us. And this idea of anthropomorphizing him, you know, that this, again, this sort of idea of him as a, as a deity, as someone who looks down and in benign judgment, hopefully. Um, so for years, this is probably um, the group that you know best. Um, there was a, a state cruise went up there every year. And in 1860, there was a man named Niels Nielsen who worked for the bridge, um, bridge division of the state highway department. And they liked bridge workers to go up and work up there because they weren't afraid of heights and they had good balance. And a lot of the same kind of equipment was used um, to the kind of wires and things to keep the old man together. Niels Nielsen was on that crew. And within a couple of years, he became the sort of head of the works. And for years, he also became kind of the face of the people who went up there every year. Um, he was really good at attracting press and he was really good at getting volunteers. So he found someone who volunteered to come up with his helicopter every year and deliver a lot of the equipment up there instead of taking the tram up. By this time, the tram had been um, installed. Um, and he had a publicity stunt, I think, with Dick Hamilton. I think the two of them did it together, where they delivered pizza to the crews as they were working up there. And of course, the press covered that. And um, But it became kind of this annual event that everybody looked forward to, and the press would go up there. and. You know, reports I've gotten was that at, at certain times everyone else is doing the work and Niels is sitting there entertaining the press, but it got people to pay attention and, um, you know, donate because they, you know, the state certainly welcomed a lot of help in getting this, um, uh, keeping the, the old man up there. And you can see, you can see some of the turnbuckles up there. But you can also see Niels and his crew start going over the side too, because they realized there were also parts along the um, face that were in deep, deep trouble as well. And so they had a system of, of um, again, these sort of turnbuckles and epoxy and things like that. And they would take measurements and report on um, uh, whether there had been any significant changes. And there really hadn't been, the, things seemed fairly stable. Oh, and this is, um, there was also, there used to be a little museum up there. This is actually how I got involved because I curated that first museum. It was up at the ice cream stand right near the viewing section. It's closed now, um, but um, this was a little museum that um, the um, private entities dedicated to Niels Nielsen. He became known as the caretaker of the old man. That became his official title. Um, and when he retired, when he could no longer go up there, he had to have his, um, he was diabetic and I think he had to have his leg amputated or his lower part of his, like his son David took over. His son David and his daughter-in-law Deb had continued to go up there and David was named the caretaker as well um, after that. But it was really nice, this, this little exhibit sort of told the story of the efforts to keep the old man up there. Um, and when he fell, well, this is, um, I'll, I'll get to when he fell. So this is just another, another image. What, what that gentleman is doing right there is making some seismic studies because some of you who are in New Hampshire in, oh, it shouldn't happen, um, throughout the 1960s, 70s and 80s may remember all the controversy about the Route 93 passing through the notch. Um, it lasted a long time. There were lots of lawsuits. Route 93 stopped south of Franconia Notch and then continued north at around Littleton and continued up. And people had to rely on sort of local roads between there. 
Um, the, there were all kinds of agencies and lawsuits and everything else. Um, and eventually a compromise was reached so that when you go through now, you see that it does narrow to just two lanes at, at times and, and the traffic is 40 miles an hour at the most. Um, the, um, the width is much narrower and the, um, the, I guess the vegetation and things like that are different than, than a regular, um, regular throughway or highway. Um, so thankfully that was finally finished in I think 1988, wasn't that long ago. So there were lots of seismic studies because again, the old man was at the center of this controversy controversy because people were worried that the vibration of the blasting for the making the road as well as the constant traffic going through was going to endanger him. So there were lots of studies that went on um, that actually determined that there was probably not going to be that much, you know, if they could control the, the blasting, that there probably wasn't going to be that much of an effect on the old man. Um, and I'm just showing you, this is probably one of the most popular items in our exhibit. It's a t-shirt that someone saved from the 70s that her, I think her boyfriend designed. And it's, it's the old man saying, screw 93. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many people have said to me, you know, if you reproduce that t-shirt, I would buy it. <laughs> but there were a lot of, there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, sort of lie down in the road protests, but there was a lot um, in the press and um, in uh, it, it got into federal court. I think it actually went to the appeals court. And finally, I think it was a compromise with the senator, one of the senators in the Department of Transportation, but I'm not, I can't remember exactly. Um, when the old man fell, At first, people thought it fell because that forehead ledge finally slipped forward. And Brian Fowler, who was a geologist who had actually done some of the seismic studies back in the 70s when they were doing that, did what he called an autopsy of the old man. And what he determined was that the, um, it was actually from down below, sort of down towards around the chin, that as soon as that part fell, the, um, the center of gravity shifted and then everything came tumbling down afterwards. And just so you see, you can see, you can see the uh, turnbuckles just sticking out there after everything fell. And here again. And this, it looks like dirt, but apparently that's just sort of the crumbled granite. That that's what happens to that granite when it's old and weathered. And this is the way it looks today. Far to the right is where the old man would have, you would have seen a little bump because that's sort of the wrong orientation. But, and also if you, when you drive through here, you see all those slides there. You know, it, it makes sense that, that that formation was destined to end up sliding down the mountain because on both sides, um, there are so many rock slides and, and on occasion, the whole road is blocked because of, of the, you know, the same nature of that granite just gives way and, and slides down. Um, boy, that didn't come through very well. Just to remind you that our exhibit is running through September 16th. And this little bit that I've talked to you about, all of those themes are sort of more fleshed out and there are all kinds of wonderful objects and artifacts that help tell the story um, of the old man. Um, so that was very quick, but <laughs> there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot more I could tell you. But um, does anyone have any questions or comments about any of this, anything further I can delve into or? Do you, have you done any research on the other profiles? I know Indian Head is still there, right? Yeah. There was a lady. The yeah, time. the watcher. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really haven't. Um, you know, it's, it's, that would be an interesting offshoot too. I think the, the old man is so, 
like there's no question that's a profile of a person and the others I think you kind of have to squint and go like that but I think there's something to why do we have this tendency to want to see people or animals in that you know what I mean like you know that I think that's an interesting question um but yeah but I I haven't really Do you know if there's still a committee for the whole thing? There so is. On the bottom of one of the things. Oh, is that the? Uh, yeah, that. That one. Okay. So the museum is a little bit in limbo right now. The museum is um, the. I think David Nielsen has the um, is the has the sort of title of president of that. The really active organization is the Old Man of the Mountain Legacy Fund. They were the ones who kind of took over after the revitalization task force. So when Craig Benson formed what he called a revitalization task force, he um, there was a group that consisted of politicians, Dick Hamilton, geologists, um, the state um, cultural affairs commissioner, people like that when they determined that, and also some people sort of involved in tourism, when they determined that they didn't want to rebuild, um, this a group sort of spun off from that called the Old Man of the Mountain Legacy Fund. And they planned, they were the ones who planned the profilers working with this revitalization task force. And they also had plans to do a big museum, um, to do a big sort of granite archway they had huge plans um it ended up they only ended up doing the profilers for a number of reasons but one of the large reasons was this was in 2008 and if you remember 2008 when the economy kind of tanked they just realized they would never be able to get all of this had to be done through fundraising and so the profiler plaza they thought was the most important thing to do um the um Legacy Fund still has many of the um, submissions for what people wanted to do up on the cliff. So they sort of took over where the revitalization task force was. The museum was really David Nielsen wanting to expand on this museum that was up at the ice cream shop. Um, and so it may be that they'll they'll come together because the from what I understand the museum piece isn't they're not really doing that much now there is actually some there are some objects at the tram um, center at um, at Cannon if you walk into Cannon and sort of go straight back there is part of the exhibit that I did that was at the ice cream stand because that's not there anymore because there's no ice cream stand and you know um but that is that hasn't really been touched for a while it really needs an uplift so i think this is an opportunity it's been 20 years i think this is an opportunity for a lot of these organizations to come together um and we're you know with the exhibit at the white at the museum of the white mountains hopefully that'll you know help kind of figure out what's the best way to tell this story and where? Should they decide to, to do the museum in front of the university simply because it was an existing facility versus having to build something at Profile Lake? Oh, really? right. No, so the exhibit at the Museum of the White Mountains is a temporary exhibit. So it only lasts through September 16th. So um, it's real, it's a really separate. So the Museum of the White Mountains mission is to present exhibits that have any connection to the White Mountains. And so because it was the 20th anniversary, it made sense to, to do it. Are there plans to, to sort of... I hope so. I, I, you know, I, think, I think that there are plans to plan. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, I, I, think that, I think that a lot more people now are interested in preserving this information and presenting it in a way like we have at the Museum of the White Mountains so that when tourists come through, um, they can understand what 
what the old man was and sort of it, this is also a great history of tourism in the area um it's a great i didn't i didn't um, explain the geology that well but it's a wonderful way to um understand the geology of the region as well i think um even if we do some reproductions of paintings there's some wonderful artwork that you know was inspired by the old man so there are many ways to um I think continue to attract tourists to understand more about the region and and especially when they're from out of state and don't understand why people are making a big deal out of this thing and why our state road signs look that way they'll you know they'll have an answer so I think I think that eventually it will happen the preservation efforts that you described in the early 20s mm -hmm. Is that on the heels of Roosevelt and starting Yosemite in the National Park efforts? Oh, that's a, you mean uh, with Edward Geddes? When 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 they took it over, you know, yeah. for a tree. Was oh, I see what you mean. That would not happen in the nineteen twenty yeah. nineteen twenty three. Yeah, I yeah, it's the whole progressive movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and in fact, I'm glad you asked that question because the, um, the museum is having a lecture series which you can zoom into. And um, if you go to the Museum of the White Mountains website, you can get the, the, um, the list. One of the people who's speaking on, um, for our lecture series did the work primar primarily around this story. And she links it with the progressive movement and she's giving a talk. She, she wrote two books about it. Her name's Kimberly Jarvis. But yes, thank you, for, thank you for bringing that up. I didn't, never got into that too much, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. It was sort of this, it, you know, it's, it's the idea of um, how preservation is something that is, you know, a, a political and patriotic um, statement and yeah with and with preservation of the parks and and the um focus on parks at around the same time yep absolutely where at plymouth is the um the exhibit it's um the museum of the white mountains is if you do you know plymouth at all so if you go through plymouth center and you go up i think it's high street so do you know where the library is? It's almost across from the library, a little bit further up the hill. It's in an old church. Okay. Um, so you're going through Plymouth, you make that right, and you go up the hill, you'll see the library on your left, and then you'll see the church and a sign. Um, did I describe it right, Nick? Yes. Is, that high, is that High Street? I think it is. I'm missing out Highland Avenue. Yeah. I think Highland was on the right side because I closed okay. off this listing. Yeah. But, and it's places. it's a wonderful space. It's an old church. And in fact, David Nielsen came to the exhibit, who was the last caretaker of the old man, and he told us he was baptized in that church. So it was really you know, it was really nice because he he and his family are so connected with the old man. Um he also lent us the bosun's chair that he and his dad and his his wife sat in to go over the edge so that's that's exhibited in, in the exhibit when when eisenhower came up sherman adams was his chief of staff and so there was a lot of political <clears throat> patronage oh there. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that um i i went through a lot of uh documents of letters back and forth and it was really sherman adams who Really, I think made it's all that happen. Do you know was Sherman Adams still chief of staff at that time? I when Eisenhower came up or had he resigned? I think he still was. I, I think he was. It wasn't until later on that he had the problems that he ran into. He um, and I think, from what I can tell, they weren't even this three cent stamp. That was kind of a surprise. I, you know, they were talking, you know, I was looking at letters and it was someone from Littleton who had really sort of started this idea and got all the these. Stamp company in Littleton, the stamp collecting yeah. company, a gentleman who was speaking. Um, the other people with Eisenhower, do you know? I, that, that looks like Hugh Gregg, doesn't it? The one, I don't know who the other people are, but the oh, one, the right. 
the one uh, facing us. I think that looks yeah, like a Greg. Could be Mr. Greg there. I don't recognize Sherman Adams there. That's why I want to <laughs> yeah. get something to do with it. But I wonder if he was. But that's a good. I, maybe I'll look and see. But I'm pretty sure he, his name was on a yeah, lot I'm of sure correspondence. Yeah, sure but Great. they. Um, but I saw a correspondent saying, oh, it takes so long to get a stamp. I don't think we can do this. And then all of a sudden they got, there was a letter saying, good news, we're going to have a stamp. So that was one of two stamps. The, um, the other was uh, at the bicentennial. When Eisenhower spoke, he didn't, he wasn't, I, I went. Oh, you did? Yeah. And I think he, he must have been a baby. A parking lot at mm -hmm. and then he was. He wasn't that near to the old man when when he, he spoke. Piano. Yeah, so that's that must have been. They must have built some platform yeah. for him to just take a picture on, and then, yeah, because there's like, no room there, I, there's not really any room to have a big no, crowd no, there. He was in a big parking lot. Yeah. Um, when they so they and they did a pageant then too, didn't they? Do you remember? I know they did a lot of musical no, events. Him. Yeah. yeah. There's a great there's a great story that I love that um, so there was a woman named Frances Ann Johnson Hancock who was from Littleton and she wrote poems about the old man when she was young and she won prizes and then she um, wrote music and her music was played at the first dedication in 1928 and then it was played here too with the boys she worked with the the um, head of the boys choir from Mount Washington, something or other. And um, there was a letter that said to Francis Ann Johnson, I want, you know, with this letter, I want to introduce you to, I think his name was Frank Hancock. He runs this camp and he has a boys choir. And I want the two of you to work together to, to work on your performance. And she married him. And I just thought that was so sweet because <laughs> she, she dedicated her life to the old man. She was a teacher in Littleton. She did, this is what I really wanted to find. She did a puppet show about preserving Franconia Notch that she would go around to schools and do this puppet show. And I've been looking for the puppets and I can't find them. But her life was all about the old man and, and culture in the upper valley, you know, the north of the Notch and all of this. And then she, she lived right near me. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and Do you have the never puppets? Saw her. She oh, just, really? She was like a recluse. Oh, yeah, I, I was Frank? She was, was a teacher in the old then. Or, oh. She was just very quiet. Didn't like the kids in her yard. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Yeah. She was Frank dead by then? Was her husband gone by then? I don't. I don't think he was around. I think it was just her. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Interesting, because she there. You know, I've seen correspondence from her, and she was. She really felt, I think almost like the Nielsen family, she really felt like the old man was hers, you know, that she was the spokesperson for the old man. But. That's always a little amazing to me because I did a little bit of studying on um, glacial geomorphology and the fact that this even existed because of the retreat of the glaciers and such, and that that small footprint on this big glacier would end up in such a unique form. Yeah. Design. Yeah. And, and that you can only see it for such a short, and that was the problem with, I gave a talk on the artists of the old man last week, and um, frankly, they get kind of boring because there's this very short view, viewing section, so all of the paintings look alike. I mean, they're just, you know, you have to do what David Johnson did and really, you can't see the old man and Profile Lake at the same time and have it look like that, but um, yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot of variety in <laughs> But um, yeah, it is. It's such a geologist in the 1960s called it a miraculous accident, which I think is a nice way to describe it. Do you know when the last painting was done before it fell down? So many photographs. Yeah. Um, Samuel Garrett, oh, uh, no, um, George McConnell was a painter from Maine who would come over and the last paintings I've seen are 1919. And I know there was someone just told me about a, a female painter who also was coming over into the 1920s and making paintings. Um, and there was a shop that I think continued, there was a, the Profile House had a shop called the Wonder Shop and they sold memorabilia. 
And I don't know how much longer they were in business after that. So I bet you there probably were a lot of paintings through, I don't know. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, it's most of the ones that you see, like you had right, in the 19th Right, and right. And, um, and the photographers, Guy Shorey did a lot. He was a photographer who had a studio in Gorham, New Hampshire. And um, Charles Sawyer, who did hand-painted photographs, and he was making them into the 1950s and selling them. Um, and his photographs were probably the collectors, what collectors were buying, but. Is there any evidence of the Native Americans who were traveling down that way, recognizing him and using the image in any fashion? The, no, I mean, so what, what we know is that um, Native Americans pass through that area. There's no evidence of set, real settlement. And the paths that were already established when the colonists were there didn't bring them by a spot where you could look up and see the old man. On the other hand, just like those guys who were surveyors, the lake is right there. And you would think they might have gone down to the lake to get yeah. water. Yeah. So there are tales from Abenaki and Mohawk or Abenaki. I just learned that the pronunciation is Abenaki and Mohawk um, tales that talk about um, various figures, um, you know, warriors who are pure of heart or leaders whose images are frozen on the side of a mountain. And so that might be a reference to the old man. The Jesuits from Quebec, I think, are probably the best bets because they were very good at documenting, talking to the indigenous people in the area. But I just haven't had a chance to really dig into that. The other thing is, every there, you know, the lore about the old man was he was here from the creation and he'll be here forever, or you know, who knows how long he's been here, 20,000, 100,000 years. It could very well be that he didn't look like that until, you know, a few days before 1805 when those yeah. people came. I mean, given the nature of the, um, you know, crumbly rocks up there. Um, and all of the tales that um, have been, were published in the 19th century were romantic tales that were told to white authors. So you just, you just don't know. And that's, um, I mean, that's, that's a lifetime of work, I think. That's somebody's PhD dissertation, which, so. <laughs> but I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping with this exhibit, too, some people might come forward with information. But. Well, if there's already plans for whatever this um, collection goes to in the future, but I do know that the State Library has, you know, nice little collections like this, and uh, they would be interested. Yeah. Well, what we... Um, a number of the objects are owned by the Museum of the White Mountains, sort of gifted by the New Hampshire, um, the um, Old Man Legacy Fund. But those are primarily paper, like letters and things. Um, the beautiful objects, like from the hotels, are owned by a private collector. And those, are, I know, are going to the Historical Society. Um, the paintings are owned by a number of private collectors in the state. Little tiny objects like the punch. So there's not a lot that um, that I control. I control nothing. Um, but I think that's good to know, though, that this that the library is also um, has a small collection. Yeah, yeah. And the Historical Society does a good job of keeping track of all of that, too. But but thank you for thank coming. So thank you. <laughs>